This morning I'm going to talk about some insights from the Last Supper. The Last Supper contains Jesus' last words before he was crucified on the cross. Jesus' last words were very important for his disciples, and I believe they're very important for us today as well. Oftentimes we have people's last instructions, the last will and testament, what they, what they are going to do, what they're telling people. And these are, in one sense, Jesus' last will and testament, the very important things that he had to tell his disciples about before he passed on. And so they have great significance. And so this morning I want to put Jesus' teaching and the things that happened at the Last Supper in, in the context of of three marks of a biblical church, three marks of a biblical believer. Each of these marks, I believe, must be taught by a biblical church. And each of these three marks, which are actually commands of Jesus, need to be obeyed and experienced by each believer. The first mark is salvation by faith alone. Probably the most Famous and popular verse in the whole Bible is John 3.16. It's for a reason. It summarizes the gospel in one verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so according to this verse, what must a person do to be saved? Well, you can circle the little word in there. What is the little word? Believe. You have to believe. You have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation is not about being good enough. It's not about earning our way to salvation. It, it is not good people go to heaven. It's those who believe, those who have faith. True faith in Jesus, to have faith in Jesus, to believe in him, means to, the Bible tells us, to confess him as Lord. What that means is that we obey whatever he tells us to do. We are followers of Jesus. We follow his example. Now, the Lord's Supper was given by Jesus, as we'll see today, and we'll actually experience that, as, the, as a perpetual ordinance in the church. Paul reminds us of Jesus' last words about the Last Supper, we refer to it often as communion or uh, the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24 says, When he had given thanks, he broke it. This is Jesus breaking the bread. And said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So when we take communion, we remember Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross. As believers, we also remember our faith and our commitment to him. And we look forward, since he's alive, that he's going to return soon, the Bible says. Now after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples several times and he gave them two more marks of a biblical church and a biblical believer. The second mark is the ordinance of believer's baptism. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus told his disciples, he commanded them, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So once a person puts their faith in Jesus, once they become a believer, once they are saved, they are to be baptized, baptized in water. It's Jesus' command. And when we do that, it brings blessing into our lives. Believers and only believers are to be baptized, baptized once after they are saved. The third mark of a biblical church and a biblical believer is spirit baptism. It's commanded by Jesus in Acts 1 verse 4. It says, well, Staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard of me. For John baptized with water, but you 
will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the scripture says that spirit baptism gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out God's plan for our lives. And as we read through the book of Acts, we see example after example of these three marks being practiced as the church grew. They are to be the marks of every believer. Uh, They are the marks of every believer in the New Testament. Three marks are salvation by faith. Second is believer's baptism, believer's water baptism. And third is spirit baptism. Today we're going to talk in a little more detail about Jesus' teaching at the Last Supper. We're going to talk, first of all, about the blessing of the Lord's Supper, which we will partake in in a few minutes. Luke 22, verse 17, And he, that's Jesus, took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And so the first insight that we see here is that the Last Supper is done with other believers. Jesus took the Last Supper, ate at the Last Supper with the rest of his disciples. And so what we learn from this Last Supper, we can put into practice in our regular observance with communion. And how did Jesus begin? He began by giving thanks. So really, in communion, the heart of it is to give thanks to God for what Jesus has accomplished for us. Jesus then looks forward to his return. He talks about, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until until the kingdom of God comes. When is the kingdom of God coming? It's, It's coming when Jesus returns. It will come in its fullness. Jesus then instructs his Disciples about the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Verse 19, and he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so the bread that is broken as we take the Lord's Supper represents the body of Jesus Christ, broken as a sacrifice for our sins. We are to take this communion regularly. It doesn't say exactly how often. We do it about once a month here, which is common. And we are to remember what Jesus has done. Why are we instructed to remember? Because we forget. We forget. And so it's one way for us to remember what Jesus has done for us. The cup then represents Jesus' blood and a new covenant. The new covenant, which was brought by Jesus, replaces the old covenant of the Old Testament. And the new covenant's foundation is salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Through his death and resurrection. There's nothing magical that happens with the bread and the cup, as some believe. There are simply symbols of a spiritual reality. And the presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit is there in a special way. When we follow his command, when we follow his instructions, and participate in communion in the Lord's Supper. Verse 21, behold, the hand of him, this is Jesus talking, who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them could be who is going to do this? So at this table of the 12 disciples, who was there? Judas was there. And as we've seen in past Sundays, Judas had already conspired to betray Jesus and talked to the Jewish leaders, and they already had a plan for Jesus to be arrested and crucified. But notice in this verse it says that 
The Son of Man goes as it has been determined. This was all part of God's plan. It was not an accident that Jesus died on the cross. It was like, oops, we didn't mean for, God didn't mean for this to happen. No, it had been predetermined. Judas, a disciple who had been chosen by Jesus, who had been with Jesus for three whole years, heard him teach, saw the miracles, had chosen to stop believing and following Jesus. The Bible makes it clear that he is spending eternity in hell apart from him. So other scriptures we don't have time to look into this morning instruct us to examine ourselves when we take communion. We are to examine ourselves to see if there's any sin in our lives that we need to repent of, to turn away from, and ask for forgiveness. The scripture teaches that if we have unrepented sin in our lives, when we take communion, we become subject to God's judgment. The scripture talks about people becoming ill because of they've taken communion without repenting of their sin, and even people who have died. In Judas' case, we know what happened to him. He took the Last Supper with Jesus, and he betrayed him. He went out and hanged himself and spent eternity apart from God. But when we take communion rightly, according to Jesus' instructions, and when we have our hearts clean by repenting of any known sin, then it brings blessing into our lives in a special way. At the Last Supper, Jesus also teaches his disciples about becoming a servant leader, verse 24. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, but those in authority and those in authority over them are called benefactors. It's not really clear to me what caused this argument among the disciples. We know that They knew somebody was going to betray Jesus. And uh, they may have been wondering who would be the leader after Jesus died. But I'm not sure that really makes sense because they didn't really believe he was going to die. They may have been simply filled with pride and ambition. And so they were arguing. And Jesus reminded them that this is not the way followers of Jesus ought to be. This is the way unbelievers talk. They want to be the greatest. They were to be different. Verse 26, he says, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater? One who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. So Jesus then makes the point that The greatest leader is the one who serves the most. In fact, Jesus reminds them that he was not acting as a leader, but as a servant. In John chapter 15, another account of the Last Supper shows or gives us the account of Jesus serving these 12 disciples by washing their feet, taking the lowly role as a servant. Jesus then speaks to the rest of his disciples. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And so the disciples, the eleven, that were truly following Jesus were going to be rewarded. When the kingdom came or comes in its fullness, they are going to eat and drink with Jesus at his banquet table. And the Bible also says elsewhere that all believers are going to be given responsibility in the age to come in the kingdom. And we're all going to eat at this banquet table that is described in the book of Revelation that Jesus has for every, every believer. As we remember what Jesus did for us in his ministry and his death, and his resurrection. God wants us to follow his example, to be servant 
leaders. Not somebody who orders people around, but someone who leads by serving. And that's the example that Jesus gave to us. We are to lead others, to follow him as we are. We are to lead by example. Finally, the last insight God wants to talk to us about withstanding Satan's attacks. Verse 31, Jesus speaks to Simon or Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Not only was Satan after Judas and he succeeded there, but Satan was also after Peter. And he says that the devil or Satan wants to sift you like wheat. It, that means that he wants to shake Peter up and tempt him to separate himself from Jesus. Notice that Satan had to get permission from God to tempt Peter. But Jesus said, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus had already prayed for Peter that his faith would not fail. Now we know that Peter did give in to fear. He denied Jesus when it seemed as if his life depended on it. And yet Jesus prayed for him that he would turn again. What does that talk about? It means that he would repent. That he would turn away from his sin and be forgiven and be restored. And that's what happened with Peter. He became the rock, which is what his name meant. He became an important leader in the early church, the place that God had designed him to be. How did Peter respond? He said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times. Deny three times that you know me. Peter thought he was immune to temptation, but pride, as the Bible tells us, goes before a fall. And Jesus told him before the day was over, he would deny Jesus three times, and that's exactly what happened. So what can we learn from Satan's attacks? In our passage, we see two men attacked by Satan. The first was Judas, and the second was Peter. Both fell to temptation. Judas betrayed Jesus, Peter denied him. And yet their stories end very differently. Why is that? Peter repented, and he was forgiven. Judas refused to repent and hanged himself. What was the key to Peter's repentance? It was prayer. Jesus prayed for him. The key for us today is prayer as well. We know that Jesus is praying for each of us in heaven today. The Bible says he's interceding for us. No matter what you're going through, no matter if nobody else is praying for you, Jesus is praying for you. And take comfort in that. But we also need to pray for ourselves. We need to pray for others that will be able to withstand the temptations that are all around us in our society today to draw us away from God. And if we fall into temptation, maybe I should say when we fall into temptation, we need to examine ourselves and repent of that sin and ask for forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. And that's one of the important parts of the Lord's Supper. Sometimes we overlook. Important part of communion. We need to examine ourselves, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us any sin in our lives that we might turn away from and receive forgiveness and cleansing. So the Lord's Supper is something that we're instructed by Jesus to celebrate regularly. It's God's plan for us. It strengthens us against Satan's attacks. It helps us to Remember what Jesus did for us and look forward to his coming again. It's a way to center ourselves on the important things of the gospel. Now, in order to take 
communion, you need to be a believer. To become a believer, you need to repent for the first time of the sin in your life and turn away from it. And the Bible says all have sinned. Uh, so there are no exceptions to that rule. We all need to repent. There's nobody except Jesus who lives a perfect life. We need to repent of our sin, put our faith and trust in Jesus, believe he rose from the dead, ask for his forgiveness, and submit our lives to following him all of our days. So I'm going to pray right now. I'd encourage everyone to bow your heads. And if you never prayed a prayer like this before, I'd encourage you to pray along with me. If you'd like to recommit your life to Jesus this morning, you feel like you've strayed and you want to recommit your life, that would be a good thing to do as well. So let's pray. Father, today, I repent of the sin in my life. I turn away from it. I, I choose not to go that direction anymore. I choose to turn away from that sin and to turn towards you. I believe in Jesus. I believe that he died on the cross, that my sins might be forgiven. I believe he rose from the dead and is alive today. And I submit my life to following him. I submit my life to following him as my Lord, to doing everything he tells me to do. In Jesus' name, amen.